The width of Gale Crater, you can see up there, it's about the size of the Big Island of Hawaii, about 140 kilometers across. In the middle of Gale Crater is this mysterious mountain that, that drew us to select this as the landing site to go to. Uh, the summit is about five kilometers high above the shadows down at the base. Curiosity landed in the plains where the shadows are and is now just working up to where where you see the first rays of light just hitting the, the base of the hills there. Uh, th this is a favorite image of mine. It's fabricated. Uh, it's meant to look like a 60s U2 image uh, of the surface of Mars, but I kind of like it. Okay, so what are we doing? Um, this, this, is, this is what we're not doing. Uh, when, a lot of the time that I spent early before we even launched was trying to explain to the general public that uh, Mars Science Laboratory is not a life detection mission. We have no capabilities to measure microbial metabolism. Uh, we have no abilities to see fossil microorganisms preserved in the rock record. The best we can do is, if we're lucky, detect organic molecules, but we have no real way to tell whether or not they're biological or abiological. So what we're really after is to try to understand what NASA balls up and calls habitability. So a decade ago, uh, two rovers landed, and their goal was to search for evidence for water in the deep geologic past of Mars. That was successful. So in the subsequent decade, the idea was to assess whether or not those aqueous environments might have been habitable to microorganism. And this is a pretty coarse filter that we, we put onto the problem because we're really asking if you had microorganisms, archaea, bacteria, the simplest sorts of microorganisms, and life originated on Mars, could they survive in that environment that you claim to have found water in? So in other words, is the water around long enough to sustain an ecosystem? Is the chemistry and mineralogy of the environment enough to do something like support simple chemolithotrophy as a metabolism? And are nutrients available uh, that you can choose from the periodic table based on instruments that, that we have built to do that? So that's really what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, I, I do just want to throw some credit to the team of engineers and scientists. At the time we landed, we, uh, the science team was 453 people, and every day there were almost 200 engineers required to operate the spacecraft to do things from uplink command sequences to drive the individual instruments to understand downlink information, to understand the rover state of health, and to be able to advise the science team on what resources we have available to plan the next day. So those resources would be energy, how much power is available, how much data can you collect, and how much time do you have to do it before the sun sets. So <clears throat> those, three, those three parameters guide pretty much everything that we do. Okay, so I need to give you the historical perspective to understand where Curiosity comes from. It begins in 1997 when, when the Sojourner rover lands on the surface of Mars as part of what's called the Pathfinder mission. And <clears throat> Pathfinder was meant to lead the way to a new era of exploration of Mars where you have a mobile vehicle. Because back in the mid-70s, we had two Viking landers, and they, had, they did have life detection experiments. They produced equivocal results. And people wondered, well, maybe that just wasn't such a great place. So the best way to mitigate against the, the risk of failure in investigating early records of life on Mars, if life ever did originate on Mars, is to be able to move around and study the ancient rock record. Because in between Viking and in between Pathfinder, in the intermediate 20 years, what was discovered from orbiters was that there was a good basis to believe that in the ancient history of Mars, there might have been a thicker atmosphere that would have supported persistent water that would have been a favorable thing for life. Oops. Okay. So Pathfinder succeeds as a technology demonstration. Um, actually, that, that was called a technology demonstration. And that's because if it failed, then NASA could claim that the mission didn't fail. And that's important in the politics of how this works on the Hill. Uh, but it was very successful. It proved a six-wheel drive, rocker bogey suspension, solar panel on the top there. The rocker bogey suspension allows you to move over obstacles as big as the wheels without tilting the deck because you don't want to tilt the rover away from the sun if that's your source of energy. 
it worked. Uh, and then in the next decade, we got Spirit and Opportunity. You can see the heritage in there. Same, same suspension, uh, same solar panels, but doubled in size to mitigate against, mitigate against the risk that maybe we don't understand the dust budget of Mars. The wind blows. Sometimes we get dust storms that go around the whole planet. And if you're doing solar, you have to know how much dust is going to settle out onto the solar panels. And if your model is wrong, then maybe you're in trouble. So we just doubled the size of the solar panels. That's how we retired that risk. <clears throat> and to this day, one of those rovers is still working because in, after the dusty season, there's the windy season, and dust devils move across the rover and clear all the dust off. So 12 years and 40 kilometers later, a rover that was supposed to last three months and drive 300 meters is still operating. But the big difference is you see the camera on top of the rover. So instead of the rover leaving the lander that has the cameras on the lander and it's just sort of wheels around a little bit, uh, that vehicle could really go off on its own for now over 40 kilometers. So we found evidence in two separate places that Mars's early history did in fact, uh, what we hunched from orbit, we could confirm on the ground that it really did have water involved in the formation of these ancient rocks. So in the next decade, we go ahead to Curiosity, which is now a full-blown mobile laboratory. You can see again the, the pedigree of the, of the suspension system. The big difference now is that instead of solar panel, we have nuclear power, so we have a small amount of plutonium-238, and it generates heat, and we capture the heat, and we generate electricity, and we get roughly about 100 watts per hour. And we have lithium ion batteries that we store energy to. So we, at night when we're operating the mass spectrometer, we can use that energy without having to worry about enough power. <clears throat> but Curiosity is a mobile geochemistry lab. That, that's basically the idea to do a more sophisticated analysis of the rocks. So there are 10 science instruments that were built uh, and operated by nine principal investigators, and it was sort of my job to make sure that everybody was pulling it together. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about the ones that are listed in black. Uh, those are important instruments that have to do with monitoring the environment. Plus, there is uh, a mass camera, uh, which gives us very high fidelity color, HD resolution. We can make videos at five frames per second, too, if we want. There's a laser up top, but I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show any data from that. It's laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, so we can shoot the laser at the rock up to about seven meters away, generate a plasma, there's an emission spectrum, and based on that, we can look at the lines in that spectrum, and it tells us what elements are in the rock, and if we decide the rock looks like it might be interesting to study in more detail, then we go up and, and then we put the arm out where we do a lot more analysis beginning with APXS stands for Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer, but uh, basically what we're doing again <clears throat> is getting an X-ray emission spectrum from the rock that tells us about the chemistry of the rock. The real workhorses in this rover are ChemIn, which is X-ray diffraction unit, and then we have SAM, which stands for Sample Analysis at Mars, and there's basically three instruments in one there. So I'm going to talk about those two because they figure <laughs> prominently here. So this is the rover. You turn it upside down, take the belly pan off, and, and you can see a lot of interesting things in there that I won't say too much about. I did want to point out these two instruments. This first one here, this is the X-ray diffraction unit. So you take something that would normally sort of fit up in this open space here and put it into something the size of a toaster uh, for 20 million bucks, and, and you can do X-ray diffraction on Mars. And then this instrument here, this is the sample carousel uh, that has 72 cups in it that we can rotate and fill with rock powder. But that instrument basically has a quadrupole mass spectrometer. Uh, it has a tunable laser spectrometer that we can analyze the gases. And it also has a four-channel gas chromatograph. And so you take all that stuff that would probably fill up a good part of this room, and you stick it in something the size of a microwave oven, that only costs you 90 million bucks. Okay, but those are the two things that, that really represent the end of the line for our, our sample analysis on Mars. So <clears throat> here's curiosity. Very quickly, people ask me, why, 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 do, why are these things working so well? It seems that NASA's getting it right. 
And so there's a simple mantra up there that's sort of like the real estate thing about location. And <clears throat> what we do is we never do anything on Mars that we cannot test on Earth. And we don't build anything that we can't test really well. So what the engineer is doing here is holding a wand, at the end of which is a little temperature sensor. And she's actually touching the rover, uh, which is now being illuminated in a chamber by a light source that produces the same intensity that the sun does on Mars. And what we're seeing here is how well the models that predict the thermal behavior of the rover are, are actually bearing out based on uh, touches to the surface of the water, uh, to the surface of the rover to measure its skin temperature. So this is the biggest source of mission failure in space. It's just a lot of these things are built out of different kinds of metal. In our case, it's mostly aluminum and titanium, but they expand and contract, not to mention the copper wire. And so you get big, big thermal cycles in space, and you also have them on the surface of Mars about 100 degrees centigrade every day. Okay, so you get done testing the rover, package it up, send it to Cape Canaveral, it goes into the, to, to the launch vehicle, and uh, off you go. It takes about seven months to get there. And in general, the landing sequence looks similar to how other missions have worked in the past uh, with one big difference. Curiosity literally weighs a ton. And the previous missions, Pathfinder and Mars Exploration Rovers, they were light enough that you, the engineers figured out one day, we can save money by not using the same technology that we used for Viking and Apollo. In other words, we don't need a soft landing. We can actually do a soft crash landing. So we wrap them up in airbags and let it fall to the ground. But in the case of Curiosity, what happens is, is that the heat shield goes off. There's another vehicle that comes out and it flies on its own called the powered descent vehicle. And the rover is actually attached to the bottom uh, of the rover, of this powered descent vehicle. And then at the very end, the, uh, the powered descent vehicle hovers, it reels the rover out on a bridle, it touches the ground, it detects the change in mass of the combined configured vehicle, cuts the cables, powered descent vehicle goes off and crashes, and the rover is pretty much born ready to go. So it's sort of like a marsupial rather than a mammal in terms of rovers. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background, and now I'm going to just, how many people have seen Seven Minutes of Terror? Okay, this, not too many, as years go by, less and less. But uh, this is a nice theater, so this should be fun. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So, when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as a seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag, our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1,600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down. 
because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing <coughs> sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms, it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane maneuver. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage, it's in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. <laughs> yeah, so it worked. And then all those engineers go off that you saw in the movie, and they have a big party, and the science team gets to work. And this was our first data. So in the first of, of operational battles that I would have with the chief engineer, you know, the engineers always want to get the most data that they can that will tell you about the, the vehicle state of health. And you can't blame them for that. But the public really wants to see pictures. They don't want semaphore tones that tell you that the, the landing worked well. So this was the end result of a big negotiation in, in which I was able to get a picture taken uh, 10 seconds after the bridle is cut. And what you can see here is the shadow of the rover. The dust covers are on the hazard avoidance camera lens covering it because we knew there would be a lot of schmutz blowing around. And in the background, we had a big debate as to whether or not that was the mountain that we had wondered about for seven years from orbit, how, how what was, was really going to be a mountain there after all. And so then you can see, yes, there was. And the shadow's a little bit longer. So what happens is we get our one picture, and it gets downlinked to Earth immediately by a link directly to Earth. But then Earth sets behind the horizon of Mars. And then we have, to re we have to depend on satellites to relay any data. So we know we're going to get a satellite pass 39 minutes later. And NASA thinks they can get the public, it was like 2 in the morning on the East Coast, to stick around long enough to watch this. So we get one picture in that, in that relay link. And the rest of it is all information that relates to engineering. So um, that's the data we get. <clears throat> and now the science team then sinks to Mars. And what that means is that we work on Mars time. And Mars actually is almost like Earth. Its orbit is 24 hours, but annoyingly, plus 39 minutes. So every day, that's like getting in an airplane, flying two-thirds of a time zone west, and, and then waking up again, and then doing it the next day and the next day. Every 35 days, you come back and phase with the Earth, and you get to see your friends and family again. 
And, uh, and we did that for several months because that gives you the most time in an Earth Day to uh, understand the vehicle and what you want to do next. It gives you the most time. And so that was the data we got. And we talked about it for a while, but then we did go to bed. And we woke up the next morning and we realized that the world was watching. <laughs> and, you know, this was a really big moment for me and, and the mission because, you know, this, this thing cost $2.6 billion. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if you take, take the, the citizens in the U.S. as taxpayers, you know, it's about the cost of a, of a movie. And then some people, once in a while, people say, well, not everybody plays taxes. And I'm like, OK, you took a date. And it's pretty cheap, but it, you want people to engage. And we really didn't know that this was going to happen, I have to be honest with you. Because after cute little Pathfinder and Spirit and Opportunity, now you've got this big SUV size thing. And we weren't sure that. But as my high school daughter told me, she said, Dad, I don't even know who Neil Armstrong was. And so what happened in between, in that decade between Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity was social networking. So that video that you just saw, that thing went viral. It was actually served by Google and it was hit so many times their servers crashed. So this mission, for some reason that I can only attribute to social media, became very popular. So then we got the pictures down that would be our first science that we could begin to now start to test hypotheses about things we had from orbit. And so you see this landscape of the crater rim. This is not the mountain in the middle. And we had, we had, in the excitement about the mountain in the middle, we didn't even think about the crater rim. But the crater rim turns out to be pretty important because what you see coming down there are channels cut into bedrock by what we thought were ancient rivers. And then out in front, you have this foreground that from about the lower half on down looks like everything we've ever seen since Viking, another boring Mars landscape with a bunch of dark gray rocks scattered around. But over here, we actually see bedrock coming out. And that bedrock is out in front of a place where we had wondered from orbit whether or not water had once been flowing. So this got pretty exciting. And then 48 hours later, we had enough bandwidth on the next satellite relay pass that we were able to get down the pictures of the mountain. And you know, this is still my favorite one of the mission. You look at this thing and you realize, you know, you guys, I think we chose well. And if nothing else, the public loved it because there's just something about climbing mountains that captures everybody in, uh, everybody's imagination. And so right about now, uh, the, the rover is just over in here. We're about to start the, the part of the mission where we really will pick up topography and we're going to go a lot slower, as it turns out. OK, so why was this interesting from orbit? So here's a map based on several generations of data but I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. You have a satellite that's orbiting Mars. It has an instrument on it, which is a visible near-infrared spectrometer, which is able to look at reflected sunlight that is modified by the presence of OHs and H2Os, their vibrations and the absorption of that, of that energy. And the reflected spectrum tells you about what minerals are down there. So these are sulfate minerals, in particular magnesium and calcium sulfates, so things like gypsum and uh, Epsom salts. And then we have clays in green. Everybody knows what clays are. And then we have a mineral called hematite. It's iron oxide. And then we have mixtures of these things. And then we have this very strange thing called the Murray Formation, which is what we're in now. And it turns out to be a jackpot of, of all these different kinds of minerals. But what you can see happening is that we land at Bradbury Landing. And then instead of driving the mountain, we actually drove in the opposite direction. And that turned out to be complicated. And, and I had to fly back to headquarters and justify why, why we weren't going to the mountain, because we had told the, the, the media and everybody else we were going to the mountain, including headquarters. OK, so I'll give you a little bit of background for that, because this is a great example of science in action where you know if you work for an oil company, you actually have a plan. You drill a well. The well will have a primary objective, which is something that you think will work. But to keep the investors happy, you really like to have secondary objectives that you might just get lucky on on the way down. And that's what happened to us. Our secondary objective became a, became a, a, a mission success. So looking from orbit, we have this thing that a geologist calls an alluvial fan. You can see all these ancient channels reaching out like this. The scale on the image is, uh, is elevation. So things that are in red are higher. Things that are in blue are lower. This is our landing ellipse. It's 20 kilometers long. 
And dead center is here, and we landed a little bit off to the side. So that's like teeing off from Tokyo, aiming for the Empire State Building and missing by one window. Pretty good drive. And, uh, <clears throat> but the bottom line is that, let's say the, the rover would have landed and broke a wheel. We had picked a landing site where you had to drive out of this landing ellipse nine kilometers to get to some good stuff and 12 kilometers before you really start going uphill. So the agency says, John, what's your backup plan? Well, the backup plan is that, look, we're landing in this place which is downhill of something that looks like it was ancient rivers flowing in this direction. Maybe there might even been a lake there. So we got other data. And this is a different type of data set. And now what is being colored here, the brighter the red, the more this has a property called thermal inertia. So it's a cold fall day. You're walking down the street. Sun's been out on the side of a building. You walk into a shadow and you feel that heat getting radiated back at you. That's what's being mapped here. These maps are made at night on Mars and they look down with a thermal emission camera and it sees the planet glowing. And so what's really interesting is that right out in front of this alluvial fan is, are all these brightest red patches. I mean, they're, they're elsewhere as well, but they're kind of concentrated there. So that led the team to two very dramatically different hypotheses. One was, well, rocks that retain a lot of heat on Earth are things like you form in Hawaii. Lava flows, dark black rocks that retain a lot of heat, and then they give it off later on. Other people on the team said, you know what, <clears throat> maybe it was sand and mud, but it got cemented with some kind of a mineral that for some reason doesn't show up in the VNIR spectrum, but maybe, maybe it's lithified lake deposit. So it was a big, big argument. And then we made a map. So the geologists got to work before we landed. And basically, the bottom line is that we touched down right about here and if you go over to here, this brown map unit is the one that glows in the dark. And for a geologist, you can't resist because there's one, two, three units right at that point right there. It's like a threefer. So you, you want to go over there and take a look at it and test these hypotheses. So that's what we did. And then this is the slide that I actually showed NASA. Look, it's not that far. Most people don't know metric, and, and so we're just going <laughs> to put it in more intuitive terms. And here's Curiosity. So we fly over it with another satellite that takes pictures. And, and this is a false color image, but those pixels there are fully saturated because the top of the rover is white. And then the butterfly wings on either side here are, are where the rocket motors have blown all the soil away. And actually, it turned out we were down to bedrock. Then there's an area of disturbance. And then you get out into the, the clean area. And then here's where this terrain, this terrain, this is called the cratered terrain, looks like the moon. And then out here is this sort of bedded terrain where you see that, that interesting high thermal inertia signature. And we even gave it the name, this was uh, one of the guys that worked on the team, Kevin Lewis, came up with this name because we wanted something that would signify that we were coming and going. And he looks at a list of 100 names and says, that's a palindrome. <laughs> so we took it. And that was our proof to NASA that we were going to go back the other way sometime. OK, well, we drove across, and we got about halfway across. And these ridges turned out to be really interesting. And we sort of hit the jackpot right away. In less than a month, we had observations that every geologist on the team were convinced that this was evidence for flowing water uh, once a very long time ago over the surface of Mars. So these are rocks. Geologists call them conglomerates. But they're basically cemented gravel. And this one I sort of likened to walking down the, the sidewalk, down the street, and seeing somebody jackhammer up the sidewalk. This looks like concrete. So <clears throat> this stuff's been really cemented. It isn't just loose gravel lying around on the surface of Mars. This stuff has really been seen a lot of water to make it really hard rock. OK, so that was interesting. That became our first science paper. But that was just the beginning because we needed, we, we were excited about it because we needed to prove that we, we were in a watery past environment. But what we were really after was the mineralogy and the chemistry. So we kept driving. And then you can see us going past where the, all of a sudden this gravelly surface just disappears. And we go down into this place now that looks like Moab, Utah. And um, 
And, and there, that's, this is the rock that was glowing from orbit. This is the, the thing that produces all the mystery. So we drove down in there, and we saw a rock that, again, every geologist, their, their heart rate went up because you can see two things here. First, this rock, this sort of grayish rock, is fractured, and then it's got these light tone minerals that fill in there, these veins. We hit it with the laser, and that told us right away it was calcium sulfate. And we can also see hydrogen in that emission spectrum, so it told us that it was probably gypsum, which is a hydrated form of calcium carbonate. And then the other thing, it looks like the rock's got a bad case of the measles. These are things that geologists call concretions, which require pervasive water in order to move elements around to form new kinds of minerals. So this just looked like a perfect rock to drill. So the scientists debate exactly where to go, but at the end of the day, the decision where to drill is left up to the engineers. So we, again, we have this long list of Canadian names. That's where Glenelg came from. So the scientists look at this, and we settled on three places and gave them names, but the, the engineers have free license to pick a better spot. So we wake up in the morning, and they've picked a spot, and they've just called it drill. <laughs> Very efficient. And uh, so we drilled it, and, <clears throat> and it was spectacular for one single reason. This, this image just says so much. Uh, Mars is red. The reason it's red is because it's got a lot of anhydrous iron oxide distributed all across the surface. We drilled this thing and the rock is gray. So if there's iron in that rock, it's not fully oxidized. And right away, if you're interested in microbial metabolism, you'd like to find minerals that are not fully oxidized. So that, that looked really good. The thing about it was I knew based on the, the testing of the uh, of the drill bit, that we had done a lot of lifetime testing on different kinds of rocks. So even before we could get the picture, you can get the telemetry, the engineering information that gets downlinked to Earth that can tell you how fast the hole took to drill. So the way we do it is we put the arm down on the rock with a set preload of 300 newtons, and we tell it to drill for a certain period of time. In this case, we told it to drill for an hour. And then what happens is one of two things. It either drills before an hour and stops, or it drills for an hour, doesn't get far enough, and it stops. And when the telemetry came down, it told us that we drilled this rock in seven minutes. There is no way that was going to be a lava flow. So we all got really excited. And now it goes into the X-ray diffraction unit. So let me just walk you through this. So it's a standard sort of X-ray beam that you're used to on, on Earth. The big difference is most X-ray diffraction labs hold the material in one place, and then they change the angle at which the X-rays intersect that, that sample. We can't do that on Earth, that's uh, Mars. That's part of the miniaturization. So what we do is we put the powder in a sample holder. It's got a little piezoelectric device that vibrates at certain frequencies that we can select. And then the material moves around. It, the beam goes through this pinhole collimator. It hits the material, and then after that, it diffracts. And so then, then we get this sort of circular uh, pattern uh, to, the, to the diffraction that we can then collapse into a normal uh, looking display. OK, so this is sort of what the sample looks like as it convex. Uh, this is supposed to be an animated GIF, but it's not animating for some reason. But you would see it swirling around like this. And we let it go for a while. And in principle, every mineral is hit from all angles, and it actually works remarkably well. So within two weeks of uh, Max von Laue's Nobel Prize in Physics in 1914, we, this was the first time X-ray diffraction has ever been done on another planet. So that was kind of fun. And it worked really well. And where the pulse goes up on the team is all these diffraction bands that you see out here are consistent with the kind of rock that you see on the island of Hawaii. Uh, but what you see down here at about, at about 10 to 15 uh, degrees is clay minerals. And that's what we're after. And we realized with this, we had really hit a good rock. So here's some data. And I'm just going to mention very quickly uh, there are two analyses. One is for soil that we just scooped up and analyzed on the way over to the drill site. And then John Klein was the name of a JPL engineer who passed away just when the mission was landing, so we named the drill hole after him ultimately. 
And then these are the standard minerals that make up a rock called basalt. If you go to Hawaii, the stuff's a dime a dozen out there. And then these are minerals down here that are formed in the presence of water. So what you can see is that this list of, of minerals is decreased in abundance as you go over to the right. But the one that really impresses here is smectite, which is an iron magnesium clay mineral derived from weathering of this basalt. There's a lot of it in there. But the other one that's really impressive, especially from a geobiological perspective, is magnetite. That's iron oxide, but it's not fully oxidized, okay? So iron is in the plus two state as well as the plus three state in this mineral. Whereas the earlier rover, 10 years ago, we found only hematite. So that got pretty exciting. Okay, so then we threw it into the SAM instrument, and, and let me just walk you through this a little bit. Uh, the drilled rock sample goes down into the sample manipulation system. There's a quartz cup that comes out, sample drops into it. The cup is then moved into an oven where we can heat it up to almost 1,000 degrees centigrade, and then the gases start to come off, and I always liken it to sort of baking a cake. You walk into the room, it feels a little more humid, that's the water coming off. You look at the cake, it's got bubbles in it. That's the bicarbonate, that's CO2 gas that would have been in there. And then you got the nice smell, that's the sugar getting caramelized. And you know, we're kind of doing the same thing, but with rocks. And so we have a dial and we can send those gases into the quadrupole mass spectrometer and that can tell us about mass, including isotopes. We can also send the gas into the tunable laser spectrometer, and that will do a really accurate job of giving us the isotopes of CO2 and methane, if there is any. And then we can send the gas over a condenser into this hydrocarbon trap, cool it all down, shut the valve so it can't leak away, then heat that trap back up, and send those gases into this gas chromatograph. Okay, this is what the data looks like. Just one example for you, I won't do any more. Um, but this is one of my favorite spectrums just because of everything that comes off. So you start to heat it up. So this is temperature increasing this way, and then this is just the signal intensity on the quadrupole. And what happens is the rock is heating up and these gases are starting to come off. And one of the earliest ones to come off is water, and there's a fair bit of water. And then shortly after that, you start to see oxygen come off along with carbon dioxide. And then some time after that, you get masses that are consistent with both sulfide and sulfate. That also turns out to be important because now we've got sulfur in two different valence states as well, in addition to iron. And this starts to look like a kind of rock that if we saw it on Earth, you know, we would think it might have been a habitable environment. One of the important things, I'll show this at the very end of the talk, is this second spike of water that comes off at about 700 degrees. That's the water that's bound into the clay minerals. That's like going back into a time capsule. You get a rock that's three and a half billion years old, and people say, what was that water on Mars? We can actually analyze it. Okay, so this all worked out, and you know, you get your picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone. We were pretty excited about that. And, uh, and I just wanted to explain why a little bit from a more lay perspective about why, why this was such a significant discovery. Here's where we were 10 years ago. We do our best job from orbit trying to identify places on Mars that have interesting minerals in geology. We land a rover. It doesn't have a drill, but it's got a scraper, this thing that we call the rock abrasion tool. So we scrape it away, and the first thing that every geologist notices is that we made red powder. So not only is the surface of Mars red, but the interior rock is also red. <clears throat> and we had all these little concretions in there, and they turned out to be the carrier of this mineral called hematite, which is iron oxide, but the iron is all in the Fe uh, plus three state. <clears throat> then when we drilled the hole 10 years later, maybe with more intuition now about where to go on Mars, here's red Mars, but then the ancient part of Mars is, is gray. So we have this more reduced environment. I wouldn't call it highly reducing, uh, but it's more reduced than this environment was on Mars. So then these are just chunks of, of rock that I grabbed. I was giving a seminar at Princeton, and you walk out of the geology department, and one side of the road has a Stockton Arcos, the other side has the Wakatong Lake deposits. But oil companies are interested in this gray rock, not because that's organic matter that's making it gray, it's because the iron in this rock is, is reduced, 
and that environment allowed the organic matter to be preserved that otherwise has been eliminated in this rock that is the typical brownstone type rock that is, makes the buildings around here. So <clears throat> rock color means a lot, but we now know chemically what it comes down to. This environment, 10 years ago, I would have concluded with an interpretation that if you go to a place in, in, in Spain called Rio Tinto, you will see an environment that is full of extremophiles that live, live at a very, very low pH. And, and the river is red here because uh, the pH is so low that iron is soluble even in the plus three straight state, which is something we don't normally see. But microorganisms do live there. It's, it's not great for diversity, but they do live there. With Gale, we're into something more like this. Now, just don't pretend you're not seeing these higher grasses. We don't think those are on Mars. Uh, but these are Playa Lakes in South Australia. And the rock in the background is this stuff called basalt. And it's weathered. And you know the water comes and goes here. But the point is, even when the water is gone, you can dig down with a shovel, and you can find a rich microbiota down here, including chemolithotrophs that are, that are basically feeding off of the chemical energy stored, in the, stored in, the, in the rock. So it sort of summarizes down to, to honey and batteries uh, how you interpret this kind of microbial ecology. And again, I'm sort of assuming not everybody in here is, is a scientist. But you know, 10 years ago, the problem was we didn't just have really low pH. That's not insurmountable. What we had was, was too low water activity. The salt content of those rocks is 50% by weight magnesium sulfate. That's one of the most soluble minerals that we know of. It only occurs on Earth in absolutely the driest climates because even the partial pressure of water vapor in the atmosphere is too much for that mineral to precipitate. So that's why honey doesn't spoil on your shelf. It's the water activity is too low. And the thing about the chemolithotrophy is that it's basically just like a battery. A rock is like a battery, especially if you have the minerals that have the two different valence states, so that you've got Fe plus 2, Fe plus 3, and you've got sulfur in mixed valence states as well. Microorganisms can harvest that energy. So that was the conclusion of that, of that science paper, is that we did have a habitable environment. It's not evidence for life, but it means if, if there were microorganisms, that would have been a place they probably could have survived. So we went on after that, and everybody kept asking, especially the media, if you guys found any organic molecules. <laughs> and Roger was really a key player in this, and I kept telling everybody we just have to go slow and take it easy, because <clears throat> you don't want to make a mistake with this one. So this is a very highly simplified slide that, that shows what we did procedurally when we realized, when we got to this Cumberland location, that, that we were measuring things we hadn't seen before. So this is a picture of, of the material. So here we scooped it up and we analyzed it. We drilled our first hole and we analyzed it. We drilled a second hole about two meters away from this one, but we drilled it in the middle of a big dense patch of these things called concretions. And geologists like concretions as a way to preserve stuff because they might precipitate very early. So that was the story with this one. And we also learned how to operate the instrument. And I'll skip the details there. But we were able to yield what were quantities of this molecule uh, called chlorobenzene. We even saw dichlorobenzene. The only thing we've really ever seen are chlorinated simple organic molecules, mostly alkanes. But this benzene got to be more interesting because it's a slightly more complicated molecule. People were eager to publish. I said, no, we're going to wait and drive a long ways away and drill another rock, which we don't believe has. So these are the ancient lake bed. That was the environment here. And this one over here, we drilled something that uh, was a different environment. Had a very different composition associated with it as well, because we were worried about contamination. And so what we think is going on here is that there are organics on Mars. We don't know if they were made on Mars, either biologically or, or abiologically, and we don't know that they didn't come in on carbonaceous chondrites or interplanetary dust particles, which have organic compounds in them. But we do believe there were organic molecules there. But what's happening is when we do this pyrolysis experiment, we heat them up in 
abundance with a substance called perchlorate, which turns out to be all over the place on Mars. Honestly, it's, it's not, a good, not a good thing for preservation of organic materials, but when you heat that stuff up to a couple hundred degrees centigrade, it burns anything in its, uh, uh, in its way there. And what we think one possibility is, is that we might be synthesizing these molecules. So one interpretation is, is that the molecules are just there, and the original organics interacted with perchlorate a long time ago on Mars and formed some diagenetic organic molecule, meaning it formed in the burial environment. Another interpretation is somehow we're making them in the instrument. But I think that we still have a long way to go, but the, the significant thing is it seems to be hard to work around the fact that we didn't find a rock that didn't have some organic materials in it relative to its neighbors. Okay, so almost done. What have we been doing since then? So we did hit the road and we drove up a long way. And what we discovered along the way was evidence for what was an even longer-lived lake. And so this is a little cartoon that, that shows a lake with rivers, and then a river, everybody knows what a delta is. You go from coarse-grained sediment down into fine-grained sediment. That's what we wound up doing, except we did it by, by climbing uphill. So you can see elevation on this side, and we worked our way up across through these river deposits into the delta deposits, and then up higher in elevation, we crossed into a lake deposit, and we've been in there ever since. So here's what a lake deposit looks like on Mars close up. Look at these centimeter scale laminations. It's what a geologist calls a, calls a rhythmite. It happens to be very fine grained, so we call it a mudstone. But here's a comparison with Earth, where the, both pictures are exactly the same scale. The, the Mars image is a little bit fuzzier because we couldn't get that close to the outcrop because it was on a, on a cliff there. But these are the kind of deposits that on Earth you see, sometimes you see glacial drop stones associated with them. So we think that Mars was an environment that was cold. We haven't seen any drop stones in any of these things yet, but it looks like an environment that was a long-lived lake. And so this is sort of what we imagine. There's some sort of dioramas up there at the top showing the, the delta building out, and then sometimes there's a lake and sometimes there isn't. And so what happens is, is that when there's not a lake, you get a yellow layer. When there's a lake, you get a, a, a dark brown layer and then a yellow layer and so on and so forth. So the lake comes and goes. We don't think it was there forever, uh, but we think that it, as a system, it was probably present for millions, if not tens of millions of years. And then after this stops, the wind blows and it erodes everything back down and it leaves that mountain in the middle. Now, I just wanted to come back. I mentioned something about that water that came off at 700 degrees. And let's just skip ahead here. Um, this is really important. So there are these, uh, these water molecules that are trapped within the clay minerals that we think are time capsules. And we can measure the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. And here's Earth. And here's the Martian atmosphere today. So this is our measurement that we can make over and over and over again. And what we find is that at the time when those lakes were forming, uh, the isotopic composition of, of, the, of the water on Mars was halfway between probably its initial reservoir, which would have been similar to Earth, and where it is today, where the atmosphere is mostly lost by, um, uh, by erosion of, uh, due to solar wind. And so it, this actually fits. It, it, it is probably not an Earth-like planet at this time, with a deep, consistent ocean with as much water as the planet was born with. Probably a significant amount of it had escaped, but we have a global equivalent layer of about 100 to 150 meters, which is no longer there. So what strikes me at this point in the mission is that we can look at this landscape that we're now beginning to explore, and we're going to work our way up that valley there, and because we can also use the mass spectrometer to date the rocks, we know that we're talking about rocks that are... Uh, <laughs> I'm close to the end. I got 39 seconds, it says up there. Um, you know, we've got... Uh, we can date uh, using potassium-argon method, and also we can date the surfaces using helium-3 and neon-21. So we know about how old these rocks are. 
And the remarkable thing about them is, is that they're basically as old as these rocks are on Earth, which have been the stomping grounds for geobiologists interested in the earliest history of life on Earth for a long time. And, uh, and if you look at these rocks, everybody will have seen one of these probably at some point in their life. It's a thing called a banded iron formation. Mostly it's a silica formation. The iron, to be a banded iron formation, to be an iron formation, you have to have more than 15% by weight FEO. And a lot of these iron formations are 10%, 15%, 20%. The ones that are economic have been enriched later on. What's remarkable to us is that we can look at the same rocks on Mars and we get the same thing. Finely banded sediments that accumulated in this ancient lake that are elevated in silica and iron. And so I, I just want to leave you with this. This is the last slide. I, I, I think that we are now sort of entering the, the realm of comparative planetary evolution. And so you can look outwards to extrasolar planets that might be Earth-like and wonder if they had an oxygen envelope, what, what you would do. And I actually think Mars is an interesting case study because if it was abiotic, it's an awfully oxidizing planet. And it's not obvious that it once there wasn't more free oxygen in the atmosphere that was just the result of abiologic processes. But in comparing Mars to Earth, we can now dig in and take rocks of more or less the same age and look at Earth and ask, what was it doing then? And then look at Mars and say, what was it doing at the same time? So thanks for listening.